chapter 4, Adam and Eve begin to have children. The first named child, the first named man who is born is Abel, chapter 4, verse 2. The second name, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, that's wrong. The first named man who is born is Cain. The first named man who is born is Cain, chapter 4, verse 1. The second named man who is born is Abel. Now, this is the first generation. Remember, Adam and Eve were created, but they were not born. Cain and Abel are the first named people on the earth who were born. And you know the story. They were worshipers. One was a true worshiper. One was a false worshiper. One was a, worship, one was a worshiper whose offering was accepted. Another was a worshiper whose offering was rejected. We, we learn in verse 3 that Cain was a gardener or a farmer, and he brought to God the fruit of the ground. We learn in verse 4 that Abel was a shepherd, and he brought from, to God something, an offering from the flock. We also learn in verse 5 that God did not accept Cain's offering, but that he did accept Abel's offering. Now, when you study the Bible and when you study books on the Bible, one thing that you'll discover is that preachers who write books and preachers who preach are not as sober as scholars. And by that, scholars are much more cautious in the conclusions that they draw. Now, I'm a preacher, not a scholar. But let me just say this. Um, you will find uh, uh, many, many preachers will tell you that Cain's offering was not acceptable because it, he did not come to God through the blood. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that we can only be made acceptable to God through the blood, through the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so they say that because Abel brought an offering which involved blood, Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's offering was not accepted. Now, if you live a long time, you will hear a preacher say that or if you read enough books, you will read that someone says that. You will find that scholars who write books warn us against that. Let me just say that that could be true, but that's not what the Scripture says. And when we get to the law, we will find that there are certain bloodless offerings, certain grain offerings which are required and which are accepted by God. So we're actually stretching what it says, and I think we're, we're importing some New Testament theology and some New Testament realities back into the situation at Genesis 4 if we declare without hesitation and without caution that Cain's offering was not accepted because it was not an offering of blood. Cain was a farmer. He didn't work with animals. Um, but we can know for sure that Cain knew what to bring and he didn't bring it. We can know for sure that God gave sufficient instructions to both brothers about what kind of offering was acceptable and that the younger brother followed God's instructions and the older brother didn't. And when Cain realized that his offering was not acceptable and his brother's offering was acceptable, he was upset and his face showed it. And here we have a, a remarkable case of direct ministry by God in the first generation of people who'd ever been born. And we may assume that even though our first parents had been banned and banished from the Garden of Eden, they could not go inside the Garden of Eden. Their children could not go inside the Garden of Eden. We can be sure that God had not totally withdrawn His immediate access. 
that they could sense the presence of God, that they could commune with God, that they could talk with God, that they could hear the voice of God still in this first generation. Because that's the situation that we find in Genesis chapter 4. So even though God had denied access to the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life, He had not denied immediate access to Himself personally. What a wonderful, wonderful blessing and privilege. And yet it was a blessing and privilege which was abused by Cain. And so when we see this amazing situation in verse 5 where we see human anger described for the first time in the Bible, and we, and we see that, that God could see on His face that He was upset, and God comes to him in ministry, and God ministers to his situation. He says, why are you angry? Why do you have that expression on your face? And he, he says, you know, you have other chances. You have other opportunities. This is not the end. This doesn't mean that you can never be a worshiper. This doesn't mean that you're rejected forever. It means that you need to learn how to be a true worshiper. And you have the opportunity to be a true worshiper. Um, let me tell you that the choice of religion, a person making up his mind about what's true about God, has a lot to do with nationalism. It has a lot to do with what country we're from. It has a lot to do with, with the fact that we cannot accept the idea that God would accept the sacrifice of someone with another religion from another country, but he, he does not accept our idea of religion and our idea of pleasing God. And so an effort is made for us to have our own religion, our own way of sacrifice, that we decide what's acceptable to God. Well, you know, it's not that another country or another nation decides. The Jews did not decide what was acceptable to God. God told the Jews. Some of the Jews accepted, some of the Jews rejected. Today, the majority of the Jews are rejecting. But we see this pattern that Cain and Abel were both told the truth about the sacrifice and about worship. One rejects, one accepts. Now God comes to the one who rejected and He encourages him. He speaks kind words to him. He ministers to him and He also warns him. He says, you know, you're very, very near to terrible sin. You must be careful. You must avoid this sin. You must fight against it. That's what we see in verse 7. This is ministry. This is actually preaching and teaching from God to Cain. In verse 7, Cain had every advantage. Cain had the full attention of the God of the universe, a private conversation with the God of the universe, a private sermon, private counsel with the God of the universe. If you do well, God says, will not your countenance be lifted up? Won't your anger go away? And if you do not do well, be careful because sin is waiting at the door for you, getting ready to jump on you. The desire of sin is for you, but you must overcome it. You must resist it. You must master it. Well, instead of listening to God's counsel, Cain killed his brother Abel. Now there's so many things to understand here. One thing is a sober reflection upon the consequences of sin. We could say that it was grace which kept God from killing Adam and Eve immediately after they sinned. God could have taken the life of Adam and Eve immediately after they ate the fruit and God would have been righteous. He would not have been unfair. God's grace meant that they were not killed. They were allowed to live a long time. But God's grace does not mean that there are never any consequences of sin at all. The consequences of sin are great and the consequences of sin are grave. If you ask any mother or father, would you like to live until the time that one of your children kills another of your children? Each of us, her parents would say, no, I don't want to live that long. 
whatever you do, let me die before that happens because I couldn't take that. Adam and Eve lived long enough to see their firstborn son kill their secondborn son. We see the exact same kind of pattern in, in David's life. God could have killed David as soon as he sinned with Bathsheba. God could have killed David as soon as he arranged for the death of Uriah, but he didn't. It was God's grace that allowed David to live. But David lived long enough to see one of his sons rape one of his daughters. And David lived long enough to see one of his sons kill another of his sons. And David lived long enough to see one of his sons try to kill him. Does anybody really want to live that long? I don't want to live that long. So it's a fact that, that David knew grace. It's a fact that Adam and Eve knew grace. But it's also a fact that sin has terrible, terrible consequences. None of us know the full consequences of any act of rebellion against God. Not only in our own lives, and not only in our own generation, but in the lives of our children, and in the generation of our children. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.